seeing the invisible. Did you know that is one of the greatest privileges we have as Christians, as those who have received the Holy Spirit? We've been gifted with spiritual eyesight that no spec savers could ever compete with. In our generation, people are so heavily focused on what is visible, what is tangible. And our generation is in danger of forgetting that the visible physical world is certainly not all that there is. We thank God for the gift of faith, which gives us the capacity to see the invisible. Let's have a look at Hebrews 11, verses 1 through 3. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Clearly stating that the invisible spiritual world takes priority and ultimately directs everything that we see. So the great business of every Christian in every generation is open the eyes of my spirit, Lord, that I might see what you see, that I might hear your voice, that I might reach out and touch you in such a real, tangible way that I will know not only that you are real, but you've placed me where you want me to be, that I might be a servant of your plan and purposes. Now I want to go to an Old Testament story in 2 Kings. You may turn to it. Uh, I won't read the whole story. I encourage you to do that. I'll recap a little bit of it. We're going to start from 2 Kings 6, verse 14. This is in the time of Elisha the prophet, a man who was gifted with the ability to see straight into the spiritual realm. As you know, he was Elijah's successor. And during that time in Israel, there were international problems. Syria was one of the enemies of this northern kingdom of Israel. And the Syrian army was constantly harassing uh, Israel. But God had a prophet in the house. Somebody who could see where nobody else was even looking. And this is how it happened. You see, the king of Syria would plan an attack on the king of Israel and all be top secret. Nobody would know about it. Totally confidential. High priority, top secret. But God would reveal those plans to Elisha. And Elijah would go to the king and say, listen, don't go to, go, go to this place on that date because the Syrian army will attack you. And this happened not just once or twice, but many times till the point came when the king of Syria called all his people together, all his officers said, which one of you is a spy? Which one of you is informing the king of Israel what we are planning and they said, none of us, but there is a prophet in Israel that tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in the secret place in your own bedroom. So now, Elisha was the target. So they said, where is he? They said, he's in Dothan. And so the whole Syrian army came and surrounded the city of Dothan. There was no escape. And then we pick up the story. Verse 14, therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. 
When the servant of the man of God, that's Elisha's servant, arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And that's my prayer for you as I hope it's your prayer for me, our prayer together that God would open our eyes that we should see not just the visible but the invisible because that's the secret of so much which is to follow. And it goes on. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses, horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Greater are those who are with us than those who are with them. That's the reality of the spiritual realm. There is no such thing as defeat. God is working out his plan. And no matter what appears in the visible realm, we know that behind that there is a plan of God that shall not be thwarted, that Jesus Christ is Lord and his enemies shall be made a footstool of his feet. So here's the thing. By faith, we see the invisible. We touch the intangible and do the impossible. I'm not going to focus so much on the miracle that took place, but just to say what happened was a miracle, and the whole of the Syrian army was delivered right into the hands of the king of Israel in Samaria. It was a miracle. Read the story. And the king of Israel said, What shall I do, man of God? Shall I kill him? He said, No, don't you dare kill them. You didn't fight. God did this. Eat, uh, give them something to eat and send them on their way. And they never came back. May God bring such a deliverance in your life, in the life of London, and in the life of Great Britain. Nothing is impossible with God. But it depends on our willingness to see the invisible. Hebrews chapter 11 teaches us that faith is the key to the spiritual realm. Read those verses again in Hebrews 11. We find it is the gift of access by which not only do we see the invisible, we touch the intangible and do what is humanly impossible. And the rest of the chapter describes those exploits by which the ancients, the elders, the, the people who had gone before obtained a good report, a testimony, a testimony of faith. And so Hebrews chapter 11 is a catalog of glorious victories and deliverances. And even when people were not apparently delivered, still God remained victorious. Faith always operates by revelation. By faith we understand that the worlds were formed by the Word of God. Imagine that. Before anything visible or physical was created, God simply spoke and out of nothing, out of the invisible came the visible world. So don't forget it, the visible world is subject to God's domain, subject to the spiritual realm. And this is the reverse of human way of thinking. We think that this world is going to go on forever and because things are tangible to the five senses that those are the things that are real. Well, they're real, but they are not the ultimate reality. There is a reality beyond that, the spiritual. And as soon as we can discover the supremacy of the spiritual over the physical, the sooner we can discover that, the, the, the sooner we're going to enter into the realm of faith. And ourselves do mighty exploits in the name of Jesus. Just a few things here. Yes, revelation comes primarily from Scripture. Now, I would like to spend an hour with you establishing that so you would be convinced that the Scripture is the priority. It's the infallible Word of God. It's the complete Word of God. And if you want to enter into the realization and revelation of the spiritual realm, know your Bible. Read it, study it, and understand that this is the greatest key to the 
invisible realm. But that is not my subject tonight. Just now, let's fast forward after an hour's teaching on that because it is important. We do give a lot of emphasis to, uh, emphasis to it here. In no way do I want to portray the gift of prophecy as a substitute or an alternative to the Word of God. In fact, every prophecy must be judged by the Word of God. Okay? However, there is a way in which God speaks and has spoken through the generations... And continues to speak today to us personally by his spirit through this gift of prophecy. And so I understand that the prophetic gift is a key to unlocking God's plan and destiny for your life. In fact, this is how God has frequently and characteristically used the gift of prophecy. God conceives a thing, purposes a thing, and he reveals it to his prophets. They declare it, and somehow, in God's timing, it all works out. In fact, the Bible says, Amos chapter 3, verse 7, Surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Now, tonight we're going to hear some of the secrets of the Lord. Some of the things that he's spoken to us about. All I am is a listener. I have the Holy Spirit like you have the Holy Spirit. We're all prophetic people because the Spirit dwells in us and the Spirit of wisdom and revelation dwells in you. And my encouragement for you today is to have faith and confidence that you can hear from God. And I believe that God will raise up out of the midst people might be surprising who, whom he chooses, people who will have very clear and distinctive revelatory and prophetic ministry in the days that lie ahead. I've experienced on time, at times in the Spirit to hear conversations in which people were speaking on the other side of the world, yet I could hear them by revelation. It's not some weird spiritual thing that is happening. It is simply that God can show you anything he chooses to show you at any time he chooses to do it. But when God speaks and reveals something prophetically, it is always with a purpose. And the purpose is to further his prophetic purpose and his prophetic mission for your life. So that together we can work and cooperate with him. I think of that passage in Genesis 18, and you will recall it if you know of the history or the story of Abraham. Abraham was called by God to be one of the key people to bring about God's covenant purposes in the earth. And uh, there was a very special relationship between God and Abraham, and, and there was a time when God said, I'm, I'm going to check out what's happening to Sodom because I, I, there's some terrible things and God had a purpose to judge that city. And verse 17 of Genesis 18 says, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? Can you see that God, God has to withhold himself. He is naturally, but maybe I should, should say supernaturally, disposed to reveal, to disclose. God doesn't hold on to secrets for no reason. And he says, Shall I hide this? In other words, I want to tell him, shall I hold it back? And then he says to himself, no, I will not hide from Abraham what I'm doing. Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Do you know that we are inheritors of the Abrahamic promise? He is the father of the faithful. Paul uses Abraham as the prototypical believer. And he was there hundreds of years before Moses he was a man that God used to show that faith is the secret of access to God and it is about God's purpose and destiny in the earth realm and God shall fulfill his covenantal promises to Abraham. In you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. We are right there and we are inheritors of that very same promise because in Christ we are Abraham's seed. 
And we shall see those promises. And we are part of the victorious story of God working out his kingdom purposes on this planet. And it is going to end with the kingdom of God ruling and the glory of God shining and filling the earth as the waters cover the sea. And so anyway, God revealed what he was about to do. And there was a purpose behind that. Why is it that God reveals his secrets to the prophets? Well, there are several reasons. God speaks and he acts. And uh, when he speaks, he speaks for a number of reasons. Not just that we should say, oh, that's interesting, Lord. It's because he's wanting action. Many, many things happen. When he speaks, we hear a word which brings revelation, which leads to intercession, which leads to preparation, which leads to everything that we need to do and ultimately leads to action. And that's what I'm calling for tonight. A word from the Lord which will cause us to pray, which will cause us to set our lives in order, which will cause us to align up with God's prophetic purposes, particularly in the decade of the 2020s, and we need to be working now to get ready for then. And who knows how God will use us who knows what miracles will happen? Who knows what visions of angels and chariots of fire we shall see? Who knows what secrets shall be revealed to us that will unlock the key to defeating the enemy? Because as it stands now, it is impossible. But that which is impossible with men is possible with God. So God is speaking to us, I believe he's speaking to us all the time. The question is, are we listening what is he saying? What is he doing? What does he want us to prepare for? Well, 20 years ago, 1998, uh, you know, I, I very often puzzle as to why God will give me a word which I have to sit on like a hen hatching eggs for a very long time. 20 years ago, 1998, and we're going to republish this prophetic word. It has already been published and it's been worked out in many ways. And we're going to deal with that in the autumn. 20, uh, um, um, what are we? 2018, yeah. I, I, I don't know which decade I'm in because I'm seeing things all over the place, but 20 years ago. And uh, some of you remember that, that word. Um, as I say, we'll re re revisit it. But it was a word about London. And um, it's a word that puzzled me for a long time. I did get some help from other prophetic people to understand exactly what God was saying. But it was about what is taking place in our nation, what is taking place in London, in which our nation is sliding away from God and is under the judgment of God. And yet, at such a time as that, God's grace overflows. And the message that came out, there's yet still more grace for the city of London. And we need to um, flow with that revelation. We'll come to that a little later on in the autumn. But God, in line with that, vision of 20 years ago, has spoken more recent word in which he has become more detailed, more time-specific, and it's all about the 2020s. Now, you've heard about the 2020 vision, haven't you? And um, I've pre-recorded a, a few very short videos which we'll play over the next few weeks to take us through it. I've uh, featured aspects of this in the keynote word in revival times in August and September and then also in October. And the 2020 vision is a response to what God has shown us about how to prepare for the 2020s. And it's all about growth, spiritual growth, numerical growth, and positioning ourselves so that we might grow in influence in society. And we have met as a leadership, and we're two years now into this vision, to seek God as to how we can 
strategized and actually implemented to put physical boots on the ground. Not just that we wave our arms around in the spiritual realm, but that we actually implement what God is saying and do what he's asking us to do so that we'll become strong and that our lives as a church and, and, and as individuals will be strong and we'll be ready, we'll be prepared and we'll be positioned strong spiritually, stronger numerically and strong in boldness and influence and watching and waiting for God to bring the deliverance and God to touch our nation once again and God to raise up a standard against the enemy and for God to send out people who are full of the Holy Spirit performing signs and wonders, speaking words of faith and encouraging people and calling this city and calling this nation back to Christ. It is possible because God is with us. So what is this prophetic revelation? I want to just pause for a moment. I want the wisdom of the Holy Spirit because I do not want to say more than what God gives me permission to say. Let's pray right now. Father, I pray right now that you would direct my mind and my thoughts and my lips. I pray, Lord, I would say not one thing in the flesh, and if that happens, let it fall to the ground. I pray, Father, I will say not one word beyond what you give me permission to say tonight. Now ask that, Father, whatever is said, let it be guided by the Holy Spirit with such force and direction that it will touch our hearts and we will receive it as from you and mix it with faith that you may work in our lives and use us. Well, the 2020s are going to be years of change and transformation in our society and, of course, in our personal lives. It will be a decade of enormous challenge. It seems that many elements have been working together, some of them behind the scenes and some of them are already visible, but they're working together together. And they'll come to some kind of climax or fruition in the 2020s. And there will be a sudden shift in paradigm. And we will be asking what happened. But we know because God has told us in advance. As already said, I'm sure it doesn't take, you know, any prophetic insight to understand that our society is moving further and further away from God. And it's set to move further doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to see that this is going to promote greater intolerance of Christian views in the public arena. Political correctness has already become social correctness. Political correctness tries to tell us how to think about God, the Bible, sexuality, marriage, religion, economics, and everything. Social correctness is that pressure from society that we would conform to the ideas of political correctness. And uh, these ideas are the dominant controlling influence in almost every area of society. It's true in education, science, politics, the media, and through these areas of society, we as believers in God and his word are put under pressure to accept this view of the world, which is largely unchristian and very often also anti-Christian. And if we do not agree with it, we must remain silent. And if we do speak out, we are publicly vilified and increasingly socially excluded. This is like the Syrian army gathering. The next decade is very likely to be a decade in which we will see a change from one monarch to another. Her Royal Highness Queen Elizabeth has been a bastion of Christian principles and she's held to the faith. In many ways, she is the boldest Christian voice in the nation when it comes to faith in Christ. 
will her successor be the same? Certainly the new generation of monarchy is going to be very different from the traditional monarchy of the past. If you have a look on YouTube and have a look at the uh, coronation of Queen Elizabeth all those years ago, and remember at that time she was presiding over uh, an empire which has become the Commonwealth, uh, the language, the style, everything seems so, so old-fashioned, a bygone era. I believe that the new generation of monarchy will be far more liberal, far more open to different religions. You know, Her Majesty carries the title the Defender of the Faith. And that was a title given by the Pope of the time to King Henry VIII. During the time of Martin Luther, King Henry VIII wrote a tract against the teaching of Martin Luther. And so the Pope said, Henry, I award you the title of the Defender of the Faith, which meant at that time, Defender of the Catholic Faith. Well, a few marriages and divorces later, there came a Protestant England in which King Henry separated from Rome. He kept the title and meant it to mean the Defender of the Protestant Faith. And that is how it's been used in every generation since. When Her Majesty was crowned, she swore an oath in her coronation, which committed her rule to promote and defend the Protestant faith as defined in the 49 articles of the Church of England, the Anglican Church. Now, all these years later, all that seems, even to us, to be very old-fashioned, narrow, and maybe even sectarian. Because people today accept Catholics, Protestants, the nonconformist churches, even the hundred-year-old Pentecostal churches have become increasingly accepted. Also, we're living in a multi-faith Britain. One thing is for sure, the next coronation will look very different from the last one. Many people will be surprised if the next monarch simply adopts the title Defender of the Protestant Faith. In practice, maybe, will, maybe that will happen, but in practice, it will be something very, very different. Perhaps the new monarch will host a forum or a council in which equal place and prominence is given to all the religions to all those of whatever faith they have. And even that sounds fair and reasonable in modern multi-faith Britain, but not all religions play fair. For example, Islam is fundamentally opposed to liberal democracy because it is by very nature a theocracy, not a democracy. It's not just a religion. It is a socio-political, economic, and military organization, which includes religion. And so you simply cannot say, oh, let's treat all religions the same. We have to understand that Islam uses democracy to bring it to a position of power and influence in order to have supremacy in a nation. And I've traveled in many different places in the world, and I've seen for myself the effects of that. I'm not saying all Muslims are like that. So, of course, Islam does not play fair, and we need to be awake to this and alert to it. Our response is love, our response is declaration of the truth, but our response is never to be silenced by those who oppose the gospel. Now today, you cannot even examine Islam without being called racist, Islamophobic, or have some kind of angry reaction. I, I want you to examine these three steps. First of all, where we are now, you can be a good British citizen and a good Muslim. Would you agree with that? Many Muslims are very happy to be British. Not much controversy there. Then how about the next step? You cannot be a good British citizen if you criticize Islam. 
We're very close to that. How is it that every religion can be criticized and the Christian religion above all things? And as the man said, there are verses in, in the Quran which are explicitly designed in an anti-Christian and anti-Jewish way. And these are the unpleasant realities that our society wants to just keep down. Is the time coming when we will be seen to be un-British and not good British citizens if we actually criticize Islam? Will we see this in the 2020s? I believe so. And how about this next step? You cannot be a good British citizen if you reject Islam. Think about that. So why should we be concerned? Why should we be concerned? We need to be awake to what God is telling us, the things that are coming. And so right now, I don't know about you, but I feel like Elisha's servant looking around and saying, wow, the enemy is all around us. We are surrounded. We're lost. We're doomed. Is that correct? No, because there is a God not just in Israel, but the God of Israel, the God of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he ain't finished with us yet. The prophetic background of the 2020 vision shows us that the church must be ready to rise up and meet the challenges that lie ahead. This is why we're working hard to inspire action on the part of God's people. Our cell groups are set to make a difference as each cell led, um, uh, leader and every cell member works together to make the vision a reality that would grow spiritually, that would multiply and grow numerically. Quality disciples, not just in terms of sheer numbers. And that we would stand up and be counted as we step out into the arena, has already been said today, to take our place. And as we do that, what kind of qualities do we need? We need to be able to see into the invisible realm, to look beyond what is happening in the physical realm and to look to see what God is getting busy with and what God wants to do. God is raising up a new generation of people who will take their place in the heavenly realms, who will be intercessors as they've never interceded before, who will cry out to God night and day for his mercy, his grace, his deliverance, and for a new and fresh move of the Holy Spirit that will sweep away everything before it as the grace of God is poured out amongst us. And God is calling a new generation of people who will stand in the place of holiness, who will walk in the place of holiness with a new grace upon their lives to overcome the areas of defeat that have been holding them back for years and find themselves walking in new paths of freedom, set free from bondages and habits and all kinds of things that hold us back, set free in Christ to be who we are and to demonstrate that freedom to the world. And God is raising up people who will listen, who will listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, who will wait upon Him and hear from Him. Not, it's not really all that necessary to keep on highlighting the difficulty in the situation. This is going wrong and that's happening and this is getting worse and that's getting tough. It's no really much longer necessary to think about those things, but is to look higher than the physical realm to see what is happening in the physical realm and to look into the spiritual realm and say, what is God getting ready to do? And what can happen if we put ourselves in that place, standing in the gap in the heavenly realms? What will God do for us? What will God do in us? What will God do through us as we wait on him? In our energized conference, we're going to be focusing on the scripture, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall rise up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not, they shall walk and not faint. A supernatural lifestyle is coming and grace 
to walk in that supernatural lifestyle. And it all depends on our willingness to receive a prophetic word from the Lord. To be in tune with the sound of heaven. God is still on the throne. God is still speaking to his people today. And I believe that God wants to impart, even tonight, fresh anointing and gifting in the prophetic. That we, some of us anyway, will be used by God in such a way that we will know what the enemy is getting busy to do even before he does it. That we will know what God is calling us to do. The end of that story was that when they came to take Elisha and his servant away, Elisha prayed, Lord, blind them. And they were temporarily blinded. And they were confused, the whole army. And he said, oh, you don't know the way? Let me show you the way. And he led them surreptitiously out of Dothan, right all the way through every village and every place until he brought them right into the capital city of Israel, Samaria. And he said, okay, Lord, open their eyes. And when they saw where they were, they were terrified. Now, I'm not saying that that is a kind of prototype of how God's going to act today. But I do know this, that when we walk with God, nothing is impossible that he calls us to do. Nothing's impossible. In times of challenge, we need to be more than ever, more than ever, good listeners to the voice of the Holy Spirit. I understand that miraculous ministry and the ministry of signs and wonders nearly always operates out of revelation because it's never about what we can do. And it's never about what we can predict. It is always about what God can do, will do, and what he is doing. And so when we hear from God what he's doing and receive direction from him, step-by-step step direction from him, we find that he makes a way where there is no way. He delivers us. He strengthens us. And he gives us a sure word. When everybody else is confused, we know who we are, we know where we are, and we know what God is calling us to do. So I believe that we are being positioned by the Holy Spirit to be prepared for the days that lie ahead. And while we speak in terms of good and evil, light and darkness, angels and demons, friends and enemies, we remember that flesh and blood is not our enemy. Our enemy is never people. People we have compassion on, whoever they are, whether the atheist, the Buddhist, the agnostic, or the Muslim, or the nominal Christian does not yet know Christ. We are called to have great compassion on people and to love people the way Jesus loved people and to speak the truth in love and to speak the truth in a way that can be most readily understood and accepted and to do so with respect, to do so with integrity, and to do so with gentleness. So this is not a call to any form of aggressive militancy, which is the way of some groups today. No, we are called to the life of the kingdom for our enemy and our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual forces. And you see, our weapons, they're not earthly and carnal and fleshly. 
Our weapons are strong and mighty, and they are spiritual weapons. The weapons of intercession, the weapons of proclamation, the weapons of loving deeds, the weapons of compassion, the weapons of tolerance, acceptance, and faith, and love of the truth. This is the bold body of Christ that God is calling to arise. And it means that we must, we're in the battle, we need to wake up to that. But let me say it anyway, get into the battle and engage in our lives as soldiers of Jesus Christ in exactly the opposite way of earthly, worldly, political, military battles. To be lovers of God and servants of Jesus Christ. We know that the Holy Spirit is with us and we know that he is moving and the way in which he's moving if you spend time and listen and catch it you see it it's wonderful it has not come to anything like the full flow that shall happen but it is already here. But if we are preoccupied with the daily life, businesses, and all the rest that we go on with, we will miss it. But if we pause a while and just say, wait, what do you hear? I hear the sound of a wind, a breeze. What do you feel? I can feel that. Something new is happening. And at the moment, it is an invitation. It is beginning. It's, by, it's a trickle. It's not a flood. But God is asking us, are you ready? Are you open to be what I've called you to be and to receive from me what I've called you to receive in this day and hour? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful name of Jesus. We thank you for your goodness and your love and your grace. We thank you that you are a God who is never caught unawares. And we, as we wait on you, will be ready, prepared, because we have heard your word and we've engaged with you at the level of listening and praying and interceding and setting our lives in the course of the wonderful future that you have for us. We thank you, Father, that in any time of darkness, your light shines brighter. We thank you, Father, that in any time of opposition, your victories are stronger. We thank you, Father, that in any time of doubt, your leading and your guidance becomes clearer and firmer. And so we say that we do not fear. We are ready. We are your children, we are your people, and we want to be your servants in this day and this hour. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.